Good evening, everyone. With it being 6.30, I'd like to call on this meeting to uh, uh, attention with the Pledge of Allegiance. Board President Lang would have liked to have been here tonight, but regrettably she's at a funeral and has other family obligations. So I'll be running the meeting tonight. Board, I'd like a motion to approve the agenda for January 19th, 2023 as presented. Second. Chad and Janet. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Eyes have it. I believe we have special recognition. It's Ms. Jennifer Joles. Thank you, Mr. Zickemeyer. It's full house tonight. I love it. Everyone's coming out to see our uh, special recognition guests. So tonight we are celebrating some amazing educators from across the district who have recently received or renewed the highest credential in the teaching profession. National Board Certified Teachers are highly accomplished educators who meet high and rigorous standards. The certification through the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards is a voluntary process in which teachers work to advance the quality of teaching and learning. Like Board Certified Doctors and Accountants, teachers who achieve National Board Certification have met stringent standards through intensive study, expert evaluation, self-assessment, and peer review. A new National Board Teaching Certificate is valid for five years with the opportunity to renew certification. And here to introduce the FHSD teachers who have newly acquired or recently renewed their National Board Certification is Dr. Jesse Altman. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here tonight to honor these amazing educators. They have put so much time, effort, and hard work into this accomplishment. I'm going to start with our newly certified teachers. And so when I call your name up, if you will come and be recognized and grab your certificate, and if you will come to the very front of the dais and we'll do a group photo um, once we get our newly certified recognitions. So I want to honor Jessica Ferry. Jessica Ferry is a Barnwell ELA teacher. She has been in the district and been teaching for 13 years. Next, we have Nadine Friedline. She is a business teacher at Francis Howell High School, and she has been teaching and in the district for 26 years. Next, I'd like to recognize Francine Hill. Francine works at Cosley Elementary. She's an English learner development specialist with 20 years total teaching and 16 of those at Francis Howe. And finally, for our newly certified teachers, I'd like to recognize Adam Katman. Adam is a business teacher at Francis Hall High School, and he has been with us and been teaching for seven years. <laughs> a, another great round of applause for our newly certified National Board teacher. Congratulations again. Now I'd like to recognize those educators that have recently renewed their national board certifications. So I'm going to start with Denise Colombini. She is a literacy coach at Henderson Elementary. She's been in education for 21 years and 18 of those in our district. 
Congrats to me. Next, I'd like to congratulate Shannon Krebs, who is a band director and teacher at Sager Middle School, and she has 18 years here with Frances Howe. Next, I'd like to congratulate Stacy Wittenauer, a second grade teacher at Henderson Elementary. She has 26 total years in education and 17 of those in Francis Howe. <laughs> there are four teachers that um, also renewed their certification that were unable to be with us tonight, and I would like to recognize those educators. So Joelle Sanders Horner is an ELA teacher at Francis Howe North. She has been teaching for 11 years and nine of those within Francis Howe. Kimberly Linneman works at Francis Howell High School and she is an English teacher and has been with us for 18 years. Erin Manfill is at Francis Howell North, a journalism teacher with 25 years teaching experience and 22 of those at Francis Howell. And finally, Andrew Meserly is the band director and band teacher at Francis Howell Central with 15 years of teaching experience. Congratulations to all. And one more big congratulations to all of our newly certified teachers and renewals. Hey, thank you, Dr. Altman. Our student board representative this month is from Hollenbeck Middle School, and here to introduce her is Hollenbeck Principal Dr. Ali Klaus. need my readers, I'm getting older here. Uh, thank you so much to our superintendent and to our Board of Education for the opportunity to showcase one of our best and brightest at Hollenbeck, as um, she will serve tonight as our school board honoree. Uh, Leah Mogg has been described by her teachers, counselor, and administration as someone who is a model student. She is unbelievably kind, responsible, and leads by example. Additionally, several teachers commented on her being extremely hardworking and communicates effectively with her teachers when she is struggling because she wants to fully understand all concepts that are being taught. Finally, Leah values her education and the relationship she has with all of those individuals around her. She supports her classmates, but also allows for them to support her. She is patient, inclusive, and understanding, and we are so blessed to have her as part of our Hollenbeck community. Please help me, everyone, to welcome Ms. Leah Mogg to you. She is just an outstanding representative of her peers and proud of her and her continued accomplishments. Please put your hands together for her. Welcome, Leah. Ms. Stiglitz will get you all set up there. If you can comment on anything that we're talking about tonight, the only thing you can't do is vote. Okay? Yep. All right, and my last part of tonight is to introduce Robin Engel and Ms. Lisa Simpkins. They're going to present our best practice presentation. Good evening, board. Thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to 
introduce you to and share some information about uh, the Francis Howell Grow Your Own Teachers Program. We have um, titled this the Howell Grown Educators Program. So recruiting high quality educators is vital to the success of our students. Grow Your Own programs are designed to support districts in developing their own teacher pipeline. By attracting and supporting our students to be future teachers, we are helping to ensure a strong future in education. Research, research supports growing your, grow, grow your own teacher programs as a viable means of creating a continuous supply of quality and prospective candidates. Approximately 40% of Missouri's new teachers leave the teaching profession by their fourth year of teaching, and over half of the teachers leave teaching before year six. Educational research also indicates that not only do people tend to go to college where they are raised, but they often tend to return to their hometowns to teach. Furthermore, more than 60% of Americans' teachers work within 20 miles of where they went to high school. Grow Your Own programs across the state vary in the supports that they provide to students. Our focus in starting this program is to educate Francis House students about the profession and to encourage and engage them in considering education as a profession and as a career. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education offered each district a $10,000 grant to be used over a two-year period to support the growth of a Grow Your Own Teacher program. And Francis Howell chose to use this grant to create a position to start this program, a Grow Your Own Educator Coordinator. The position was posted and it was open to any Francis Howell School District employee interested in helping us to develop this. I'm pleased to introduce you to Robin Engel, our Grow Your Own Teacher Program Coordinator. Robin teaches family and consumer science classes at Francis Hall High School. This is her 11th year of teaching and her third year in Francis Hall. And she's gonna tell you more about the start of this program. Robin? Thank you. Um, thank you for having me here today. I am a teacher in the district, but just as special to me, I'm also alumni of the district. So our program is called Hall Grown Educators. Our purpose is to support our students and alumni who are pursuing a career in education. We're doing this by offering them how perks. Um, this benefits our community and our district because we're opening or aligning applicants up with open positions. It's also promoting growth in the field of education and of course helping our students and alumni. How perks are opportunities we can help to support our alumni and students as they pursue their career, but it's also like going to be based off feedback and ever changing based off that feedback. So it's what our district can currently offer. So we're offering like professional learning opportunities, um, communication and job openings, jobs while in their field of education. So this program is just starting out, but we've already done quite a bit of stuff. We started out by having brainstorming meetings. We have them about every other month. And it's a great, com or a great committee that gets together. I give them an update of what's happening. They give me pretty good feedback. It's very supportive. And um, based off their experience, my experience, and our connections, we plan our next steps. So we knew our target audience to start out would be our College, alum college of Education alumni because we know they are student teaching or going to be graduating soon. So we want to make that connection pretty quick to them. So we started a database to get their communication. Uh, we are able to see what certification they're in, what college they're at, when they're graduating, and that's an ongoing database. But we reached out to them and asked, how can we help? What can we do to support you? So we planned a holiday lunch and learn, which we'll talk about in just a second. But we also asked them, like, what can we do to get into the high schools and get those kids excited too? Um, based off their feedback, I went into each high school building and hosted a meeting at the beginning of this month. I promoted the program, I talked about the career of education, and also told them about opportunities of work while they're in high school as well. So focusing on our first Howell Grown Educator event, over winter break, we hosted a holiday lunch and learn. It was awesome. Um, we reached out to our alumni and said, what can we do? What, what do you guys wanna see? What do you need help with? And based off their feedback, we created an agenda. So we had a lot of speakers, and they talked about why Francis House School District is so great, um, benefits of working here, job opportunities while they're in the field of education or the College of Education, and also allowed time for them to chat with Francis House School District teachers and staff. All the feedback was positive. Uh, one of our alumni said it was beneficial to hear how supportive and welcoming everyone is with the district. 
I also loved getting to learn about all the opportunities we have as a future educator within Francis House School District. Uh, we tried to make it very casual because we wanted them to feel comfortable. So we got up and got moving. They got to make connections, talk to people around the room, ask questions, and it was a lot of fun. Another alumni stated, I found it really helpful to see all the people in person that are emailing us and helping us along our journey to become teachers. I liked how we got to learn from all different aspects of the district and learn about different opportunities. So using their feedback, uh -oh. Sorry, went too far. Um, using their feedback and our high school feedback, we planned future steps. So this is what we plan to do next. For the alumni and the high school level, we want to offer a summer learning opportunity. They all stated they want more. They want more help with resumes and interviews and um, job application process and talking to more teachers from each specific content area. So we're, we're going to do that. And then at the middle school and elementary level, we kind of plan on following that Grow Your Own Teacher outline, and they suggest having some sort of career presentation about teaching, getting those kids in lower grade levels that they can help out, which a lot of our buildings do, but trying to create an incentive like Teacher of the Day where they can really see how it is to be a teacher. Um, so this program is just starting out, but we have lots of future steps, and we're really excited to um, keep going. Do you guys have any questions? Question for Patrick. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, if you need a board member or community member, I would be happy as a retired teacher administrator to join as just a patron to come to your meetings. And I think it's a wonderful thing that you're doing. Um, so many of our students are out there and it's scary. You know, and um, personally, you know, having people come forward with resumes and their applications, and they needed a lot of help. And it's sad that we don't provide that. And I think it's wonderful that's something you're giving our students. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Board, any other questions? Thank, Thank you, ladies. Thanks, Thank you. All right, we're moving on to our patron comments. During patron comments, residents of the district and staff members are invited to address the board on issues related to the school district. Speakers are called forward in the order of sign up and each speaker has three minutes to make their remarks. Please remember that only one speaker is allowed at the podium at a time and combining time or giving your time to someone else is not permitted. The board appreciates that you have taken the time to come, to the, come this evening and we value both your input and perspective. I would like to remind everyone that we expect that speakers will remain civil and respectful when giving remarks. If anyone fails to comply with board policy, regulations, and rules, we reserve the right to cut those three minutes short. For your convenience, our three-minute clock is ready. We welcome Tom Ferry to, the, to step forward to the podium. Hey, good evening. Um, I want to kick off tonight's patron comments by talking about our most valuable assets in the district, our teachers and staff. How can we as parents and community members be more supportive? I encourage everyone to watch one of our board candidates' recent videos on this topic. He talks about how we can and should show teachers the respect that they deserve and how we can come together as a community to find solutions for legitimate issues. One thing he touches on but doesn't really detail uh, too much in detail is money. So let's talk about those and let's talk about the impacts. These are in real dollars, by the way. I found some information on our 2010-2011 school year. So compared to the 2010-2011 school year, Francis Howell's operating budget is close to $30 million behind. That's 10 years ago, and we're $30 million behind. This creates incredible daily challenges for our students, our staff, and everyone associated with the, with the district from small things like tissues that we're just asked about constantly to provide to bigger staffing issues like janitors or custodians, I'm sorry, and paraprofessionals, we certainly can do better. Francis Howell has the lowest per pupil expenditure in the county. We aren't going to claw this back by making cuts. We need revenue solutions. We can certainly do better. Despite having more education and experience, our teachers are paid less today than they were 10 years ago. 
less today with more experience and more education. Think about that. Our teachers' average salaries are now just slightly over where Wentzville is today. It's hard enough finding good, dedicated staff as it is. It's even harder with competition from in the county nipping at our heels. We can do better. Over the past 10 years, Francis Hall has to cut 75 equivalent heads. That's not individual people cuts, that's equivalent heads, which means it's way over that 75 number. And think about all the students in those classrooms. Where do they have to go? Well, they go into all the other teachers' classrooms, which has driven up our student-to-teacher ratio to the highest in the county of 19 to 1. Oh, and by the way, that also includes all of the smaller classes, so the actual basics that we talk about a lot, those classes are massive. How are students going to learn when there's 30, 30 students in one class to one teacher? That's, that's just crazy. So what can we do? So despite all of this, our teachers and staff have persevered over the past uh, couple of years. They've held their heads high and focused on their students. I don't want to spoil it, but later in the, in the comments and in the, in the meeting, we're going to see some great MAP scores. Just a preview. So wouldn't it be wonderful if going forward, we can all come together and get the district to pass a tax levy that we so desperately need. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jesse Fieri, or Ferry, sorry. Hi. At the beginning of the year, I tell my students that I will never challenge them to do anything that I wouldn't do, which is how I once found myself in a breakdancing competition and how I find myself here tonight speaking up. Hopefully, this will go better than the dancing did. I was just recognized for achieving national board certification, and I would be remiss if I didn't share some of the work that got me here. Part of the process asks educators to identify a student need, formulate a plan to address it, and gather data to show effectiveness. Analyzing student belonging data painted a clear picture. Our kids were not okay, especially kids who are black, brown, and LGBTQ. I designed and implemented my dream unit with one main idea in mind. When my students could see their place in the texts and assessments I provided, they would also find their place in my classroom. Here are some insights I gained. Good, relevant books bring kids to the table. Representation matters. When we request new texts, it's because there's no such thing as a non-reader. There are just a lot of readers who haven't found the right book yet. When we can offer students options, they are more likely to engage. When they engage, they perform. I don't teach books, though. I teach teenagers. Building relationships is how we achieve success academically. This has been a cornerstone of my classroom, but NBCT challenged me to be relentless in my pursuit of knowledge about my students and gaining insight from all of their people and their own insights. This paid off in dividends. Teaching the basics and fostering social-emotional learning are not mutually exclusive. One is an avenue to the other. Reading is more powerful when it's used to explore your own perspective and those of others. Writing becomes a useful tool when you can express your ideas and your stories and have them affirmed. The rigor and relevance you can bring to students by providing diverse choices extends far beyond basic. We're not just teaching students to read and write, but to be readers and writers. Here's the quantitative bottom line. Through intentionally building a sense of belonging in my classroom, providing choice, and partnering with parents and counselors to address students' needs that stretch way beyond academics, we made huge gains in just one quarter of learning. On district benchmark tests, these students grew their average score on writing assessments by 14%, grew 9.1% in informational text comprehension and 6.7% in developing narratives, closed the super subgroup achievement gap by over 5% on all standards, and executed 100% on-time turn and rate for their final writing. If you've ever begged your teenager to do their work, you know what a big deal that one is. This work inspired me. It also got me thinking, what if we created a DEI culture and coordinator, someone who could identify these opportunities for all of our kids in all curricula, who could extend these ideas across staffing plans, who could find the pockets of students and community members who don't feel as if they belong and work to bring them to the table? What gains might we see then? I have pages upon pages of stories and data to share with anyone who's interested. Well, I'm really thankful to have reached the end of these remarks. I hope this is just the beginning of a conversation. Thank you. Next up, we have Harry Harris. Good evening, board. Um, while I've been here before to talk to you, I realize it's been a while. December had me laid up with the flu, but I joined you all online. Um, a patron's comments, though, resonated with me. 
He mocked the equity work being done in the district, um, but he posed the question to those of us who have asked for more DEI work, and he said, what would you change, folks? You want more equity work, you want more diversity work. And I was thrilled that he asked. So if I had the magic wand, here's my answer. I'd help those like himself understand that equity and diversity are more than racial connotations. His mockery of the equity committee showed that he didn't understand how the committee talked about resources needed for students who didn't have homes, students who didn't have access to needed technology, or students who, who were from non-native English-speaking families. Part of the education process is making sure all of our students have the tools that they need to be successful. A hungry child will struggle in school. And that's why I've been impressed with our food outreach program that addresses that. I hope that we continue helping residents understand the steps we've already taken towards equitable solutions uh, that we've made in our district and that it is, becomes much stronger. I even commend Dir Director Cook for promoting equity in an online post earlier this week, writing, not all students have the support your kids have at home. Some kids need to get it all from school. I'd ask for a centralized position to put on a district-wide events like the opportunity we missed to do something for the MLK holiday district-wide. This isn't a new or radical idea since the districts we are usually compared to like Zumwalt, Rockwood, Parkway, they all have these positions and they do great work with them. Promoting learning to live and work in a diverse environment is important to the future success of our graduates since for example, the 20 largest employers in the STL region, according to the St. Louis Business Journal, all have openly focused on DEI training as a part of their culture. These are companies like Schnucks, Mercy, BJC, Edward Jones, Boeing. You recognize those names. We haven't even reached the part where I'd love to have a more diverse teaching staff. Studies have shown again and again that representation matters and students thrive when they have teachers that look like them. We aren't asking that we hire people of color based on their race. We're, we are asking that we make our district desirable and engaging for people of color to come beating down our doors to get hired here. You can even apply this, to out, this outreach to veterans, the physically disabled, and others too. Obviously, this isn't the whole list, but since he asked, I wanted to make sure that I came and at least put a few things out there. I understand that change and differences can be scary or intimidating, but this is where education and knowledge can really work to eliminate those feelings. So I hope we can all agree that a commitment to diversity isn't some signal, but a part of our life and culture that our students deserve to have more exposure to. Thank you. Up next, we have Ted House. Vice President Ziegemeyer, ladies and gentlemen of the board, good evening. My name is Ted House. It is a pleasure to be back before the Francis Howell Board of Education. Thank you for the opportunity to share an exciting endeavor that is being initiated by several citizens in our community. I'm here tonight to announce the formation of a political action committee called St. Charles County Families for Public Schools. Our nonpartisan group is composed of citizens of all political persuasions who recognize the vital role that public education plays in the strength of our communities and in the quality of life that we enjoy in St. Charles County. We believe that public education brings our community together. As a former state senator and circuit judge, I embarked on uh, this initiative with two former superintendents, Dr. Mary Hendricks Harris and Dr. Pam Sloan. As this grassroots movement continues to build, we plan to raise funds to support various candidates who are committed to public education, as well as to engage in appropriate elections that improve, improve revenue and additional resources for our school districts. We are families who want to mobilize the vast majority of St. Charles Countyans who respect and appreciate our teachers and who want to support public school staff and administrators who unselfishly give of themselves to achieve the academic excellence that we have come to expect. And most of all, we are committed to the students and parents of our school districts, seeking to help provide the needed support as you provide hope and a bright future 
for the children of our community. We support the provision of the Missouri Constitution, which reminds us that knowledge and intelligence are essential to the preservation of the rights and liberties of the people. Public education is the foundation of democracy. And in particular, we strongly believe that public funds and tax incentives should be used for public schools. We celebrate the incredible accomplishments of the Francis Howell School District and want to highlight the variety of amazing things that are going on in our schools every day. We hope that you will consider us a resource to spread the good word about the many ways that public schools enrich our lives and allow us to live in this prosperous community. St. Charles County Families for Public Schools is grateful for your service, ladies and gentlemen, to the people of our school district. We know that it can be a thankless job, but we also know the indispensable role that you play and the critical value of public education in our community. Thank you. Up next, we have Grayson Justice. Good evening, board. Happy New Year. My name is Grayson Justice. I'm an alumni student of class of 2013. You got to be taught to hate and fear. You got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be a drum in your dear little ear. You got to be carefully taught. You got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is in different shade. You got to be carefully taught. Those are the lyrics to Rodgers and Hammerstein's musical South Pacific. It was sung by Lieutenant uh, Joseph Cable after talking to Emile Debeck in Act Two, saying, it's not born in you, it happens after you are born. The song talks about racism and hate. Randy Cook, his fellowship in yellow, and the people who voted for him, like him, think that CRT, which we don't have in the school, SCL, and the conferences that think they are bad for FHSD. But that is your opinion. You have a right to your opinion, but you don't have the right to have your opinion shoved into un to everybody else. In elementary school district in Florida, a teacher resigned because one of the staff members told him to get rid of some of our American heroes. Some of them are black. You wonder why or how that happened. It's because it was age inappropriate. A high school, in, uh, high school teacher in Missouri resigned because the administrations told him to take down his pride flag and he couldn't discuss sexual, um, human sexuality and sexual preferences. Teachers are resigning because they care of all of their students, whether they are gay, straight, bi, black, white, male or female. It's the parents that are making them harder on them with their ignorant and bigoted views on life. I approve the travel requests of these conferences that have been talked about, that have been questioned by two board members who are against learning different things that are good for this community of this district. It's a good opportunity to learn new things to help the district, students, teachers, and staff to be better people for all communities. And if you want to go back to the basics, we need to know if our students are safe physically and mentally, because schools are their second home so they can be themselves from things like troubles in home or families and parents that doesn't accept them for being who they are. Remember that. Thank you. Next, we have Marissa Polzin. Hello, board and everyone who's here. Um, I'm Marissa Polzin, and I'm a parent in the district. Um, <clears throat> tonight, I just wanted to come talk for a minute about a recent discussion that was in the Francis Hell Parent Facebook group. Um, it was kind of a topic where we're getting like, you know, we need to just teach, teach the basics. And there was a comment saying, the number of students who need remedial college courses, tutoring, tutoring and interventions is proof that the basics need more attention. As of last year, we had 1,000 uh, students, grades six to 12, who were not reading at reading level, or reading at grade level. That's about 12 to 13% of six to 12 graders. 
who are not doing the most basic tasks that a school is supposed to be teaching. So um, I wanna talk about one of those thousand students that's not doing the most basic task that a school could be teaching, and that's my daughter. Um, in the kindergarten, we knew that something was at play with her reading. Uh, her teachers at Cosley have worked hard with us to give us the, the interventions she needed. Through many, if anybody, anybody who's gone through all this, the years of testing, the tears, the IEP meetings, all of that, we discovered that she's dyslexic. Um, she can build complicated Lego sets when she was six. Um, she, an exciting Friday night is for her to like build my Ikea furniture. Um, <laughs> she loves industrial tech, let me tell you this. But she's in sixth grade currently. Uh, she is not at reading at grade level and she has a 3.98. That is because she has interventions and technology that helps her be successful. Is she somebody that you would think is not doing the most basic that a school could be teaching? Her teachers would say no. Her teacher comments would say no. Her um, grade point average would say no. Her interest in the classes that she gets to take says no. Um, so I wonder how many of those 999 other students have that. Well, 10 to 15% of the population is dyslexic. So I'm sure the rest of the 999 students probably don't have all of that, but other people spoke about, we could have food insecurity, we could have um, things at home that aren't doing so great. Um, on her MAP test scores, she gets, does a great job on everything but reading because she can't use those technologies. So um, uh, I'm getting a little off of my, <laughs> I wrote this like five minutes before. Um, so they've also shown that students who, so, so should my daughter take no more electives and just be trying to get on reading level? She's probably never gonna be on reading level. She's the highest she's ever been, which is exciting, but she's successful without being on, on the exact, I remember staying up at night crying about that. Like I gotta get her on reading level. But then her teachers were like, she's got threes back when she was in, you know, she's doing great. Time is up. All right. Thank you, Thank your you. time is up. Up next, we have Matthew Martin. No Matthew Martin? Next, we have Kaylee Windmiller. All right. Next, we have Justin McCoy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, listening to me speak tonight. My name is Justin McCoy. I have two elementary age kids who attend Becky David Elementary. Uh, I wanna speak tonight about a few things I see happening around us and hopefully help open a few minds to forward progress we so desperately need in the district. Over the past couple of years, I've been alarmed to observe the lack of new funding provided to our schools in correlation to the population growth in our area. We have politicians out here who are actively working to decrease the funding available to our school district and dismantle the concept of public education altogether. Our current school, on our current school board, we have a couple of politicians who believe school choice is inevitable as well. There are also district residents who are concerned about, uh, who are very concerned about paying higher taxes, yet constantly demand only the best, or consistently demand only the best for their children's education. The way I see it is you can't have your cake and eat it too. At some point, you must realize the ingredients that go into making the cake delicious. We are, walk we are walking towards a crisis at the bakery as a district. We must figure out actual sustainable ways to increase funding. We can't bake the same cake with less flour, half the number of eggs, no sugar, and expired baking powder. We also can't generate the same quality and quantity of cakes with less bakers. We have an upcoming school board election where we have three candidates who are running under the guise of back to basics, fiscal responsibility, and family values. The underlying notion of all these points suggests a direction of disinvestment in our district, and that should concern everybody. This brings me to my last point of concern, attracting and retaining qualified teachers and staff. It's alarming to note all of the amazing teachers, veteran teachers, amply qualified paraprofessionals and staff that are fleeing from our district. If you sit down and ask them why they're choosing to leave, it's usually a variety of reasons. Some of the big reasons are pay deficiency compared to surrounding districts, lack of support from the administration and you all, the elected Board of Education, 
And lastly, the daily emotional abuse from ill-informed parents and misguided students. As a parent, property owner, and taxpayer, I'm exponentially concerned that if we cannot properly fund our public schools, attract and retain qualified educators, and continue forward with progressive, diverse, and challenging curriculum, we will all start to experience a flight from the district as a whole. Moving forward towards the school board election time, I wanna encourage everyone to consider and pay attention to each candidate's platform and how they plan to increase funding, attract and retain qualified teachers, and lastly, support a diverse quality curriculum conducive to a top-notch school district. Thanks. Up next, Michael Shea. Michael Shea. All right, on to Christopher Brooks. Oh, where to start tonight? Uh, there's been so many amazing speeches. I I'm not sure. It's like shooting fish in a barrel here. Um, so first, welcome, Mr. House, to the uh, nonpartisan PAC uh, area here. I mean, you're a Democrat, and uh, I, I assume our former, former superintendents are as well. Uh, I invite you to find a Republican to put on your steering board so you can claim nonpartisanship. Uh, you, you might also be interested to know there's currently a PAC in the district that advocates for raising property taxes and, and Prop S funds, Citizens for Francis Howe, which had about $20,000 in their bank accounts last I checked and was funded entirely uh, by businesses, companies that do business with the district, including several out-of-state ones. So there's a lot of money going around here. Uh, speaking of money, a number of can uh, speakers tonight have have discussed their concerns with, uh, with funding. I, I hope you go do your homework and take a look at the actual uh, values of the income of the district over the past number of years. Uh, income of the district is as high as it's ever been. Now, inflation takes a bite out of that. Nevertheless, uh, revenue per student is as high as it's been since 2011. Now, the funny thing about 2011, property uh, values were going down, if you remember, after the Great Recession. Uh, but the district didn't lose money. In fact, the district continued increasing its tax revenue during that time as a result of the Hancock Amendment. Uh, so it cuts both ways. Uh, and this last December, as a million, well, not millions, but thousands of people across the county opened their property tax bills and discovered that the district, among other entities, was taking a, a rather large windfall of those increased vehicle prices, uh, we understand that the, the district is uh, doing a fair amount of, of increase in its income here. So I, I hope, folks, that you go back and actually look at some of the numbers or provide those numbers. Now, Mr. Ferry indicated earlier that our average teacher salaries have decreased, and, and you'll understand that, that the beautiful thing about averages is when you increase the total numbers, especially if you take away at the high end, the average does decrease. It's amazing, right? So, so when the district was having its financial difficulties a few years ago, a number of teachers retired. These are teachers making a fair amount of money, and they were replaced or not replaced in many cases uh, with newer teachers, right? So if you take away the higher end of the spectrum and bring in the lower end of the spectrum, you get a lower total average. It dropped pretty precipitously uh, as a result of that. Nevertheless, I uh, appreciate those teachers and the work they're doing, and, and I think we will see later tonight that, that many of the district teachers have worked very hard in helping our students to recover from uh, the map testing difficulties we've had. Nevertheless, there's still a lot more work to do. Uh, in fact, we see that some of those inequities across the district have grown in terms of test scores of high schools. Um, Mr. Harris brings up uh, interesting points about his DEI coordinator. Nevertheless, I still don't see what that DEI coordinator would do that other wonderful and engaged individuals in the district are not already doing. Uh, we already have administrators, teachers, many people doing things of their own free will, not compelled by anyone and not, not paying $120,000 a year to, uh, to do these things that are trying to make a difference in the lives of our students, and I encourage them and commend them for that. Good night. Up next, Amy Easterling. Good evening. Uh, my name is Amy Easterling. I have been a resident of this district for about 20 years. I have two children that have benefited through their entire lives from this amazing school district, from parents as teachers to Hackman Early uh, Childhood Education Center all the way through high school. Um, I have a sticker on my office wall that I love, especially as somebody who grew up in the South. It says, y'all means all. To me, this perfectly encompasses the idea of diversity. As our students grow up and become citizens of the world, they're going to encounter many people who are different from them. In higher education and in jobs, they'll have the opportunity to meet people with different backgrounds, race, gender, religion, socioeconomic class, abilities, and on and on and on, right? In my own career, 
I have learned that the most successful projects and initiatives that I've been involved in are those where there are many voices around the table. But don't take my word for it. Many studies show us the benefit of diversity. As noted by an article in Scientific American, exposure to diversity alters the way individuals think by promoting creativity and innovation, as well as decision-making and problem-solving skills. The article summarizes, diversity jolts us into cognitive action in ways that homogeny simply does not. And companies recognize this too. 96% of major employers, according to the Century Foundation, say that it's vital that employees are able to work with people from diverse backgrounds. I know that's true for the Fortune 500 company that I'm employed by. All of this is to say that we should not be afraid of the concepts of diversity, inclusion, and equity. They are not bad words, quite the opposite. I'd encourage us all to recognize the benefits that these concepts will have to our students and look for opportunities to embrace them. For example, and these are just a few, let's figure out how we can improve the number of black teachers in our district because we know that there are benefit from those voices and perspectives. Let's continue so many of the great efforts of our educators that are happening today, from a variety of student activities to exposure to college and career, to encouraging our students to think critically. Let's embrace the philosophy that y'all really does mean all. Thank you. Up next, Ken Gontars. All right, moving on to FHEA. Good evening. On behalf of the Francis Hall Education Association, I would like to welcome everyone to our second semester of teaching and learning. It is fitting that our first day of the semester was the day after we celebrated Martin Luther King Jr. who taught us all to dream about a future filled with diversity, equity, and inclusion. The newly National Board Certified Teachers, Jesse Ferry, Adam Katman, Nadine Friedlein, Francine Hill, as well as the teachers that have renewed their National Board Certification, Kimberly Linneman, um, Aaron Manful, Denise Columb Columbini, uh, Joelle Sanders Honer, um, Shannon Kreps, Andrew Mizzarelli, Stacy Wittenauer, and with our other excellent educators who we, are, who we are working each day to craft learning to help students achieve their dreams for their futures. We are looking forward to meeting with administration to have a successful negotiations and collaborating with them to be forward thinking so that Francis Health School District can be a leader in making, choice, making choices that support students, educators, and our community. We hope to bring a ratified closure document to the next board meeting for approval to uh, position Francis Health School District to be able to retain and attract the most highly qualified educators for our students as schools everywhere begin the hiring season. A Chinese proverb that I just read, if you are planning for a year, sow rice. If you are planning for a decade, plant trees. If you are planning for a lifetime, educate people. Thank you. FISPA. All right, moving on to Prop S. Matt Frank. Hi, uh, I'm Matt Frank with SM Wilson. I'm filling in for Jeremy Butler tonight to give an update on the Francis Howell North High School project. Um, I'd like to start just by thanking the district. Um, it, it really takes a lot of work to build a high school. This is a big project. and. Everybody's just been great along the way from the board, administration, teachers, staff, students. Um, we've interacted with a lot of people and uh, it's just been a great experience. So thank you for that. Um, we'll go ahead and jump right in. So a few Prop S highlights. Um, <clears throat> we did receive bids for bid package six on the Francis South North project. And that's for fencing. Uh, we got multiple bids. The low bidder was quite a bit below the budget included in the GMP. So 
Um, that worked out great. We recommend going with the low bidder on, for the scope of work, and it's currently with the board uh, for review. So, um, Next item is the site preparation work for the stadium and the track. Uh, we are getting ready to start work on the stadium and the track, which is super exciting. I know that's kind of a, something that everybody's interested in. The area is cut to grade, and uh, it's just wet right now because of the winter. As soon as it dries out, we have our subcontractor on board to start work there. Um, so that'll be pretty exciting to see going. Coordination work uh, for summer 2023. Last summer, 2022, we built a new student parking lot, which was quite an undertaking. Um, it took a bit of coordination with the, the school and, uh, and everybody surrounding there with Henderson to get that work done. This summer, we're gonna be replacing the drive from Hackman Road to Henderson Elementary. And we've started that coordination work now. So by the time we get to summer, uh, we have a great plan and uh, we'll get that road replaced over the summer uh, before school starts. So the goal is to start after school lets out and then get it completed before school starts. Um, next item is the FF&E, the furniture, fixture, and equipment budgets and schedules. Atlas and Honer and the dist uh, administration have been working pretty intently on those budgets and those are in review uh, currently. Uh, construction update. So a lot of work going on on, on the side. Those of you who've driven by, uh, you see a lot of things happening outside and there's even more happening inside the building. Um, this winter has been pretty favorable weather-wise, so a lot of brick veneer is going on. Um, it's been great. We've been able to keep working exterior to the building. Um, structural steel, all the structural steel main components have been installed for a month or two now. The iron workers are working on uh, small stuff like stair installs and small bits of steel uh, that we call detailing throughout the building. They'll be doing that for another month or, month or more, and then they'll head outside to work on some of the exterior steel uh, canopies and things of that nature. Mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire protection systems are being installed throughout the building. We're really working um, probably in two-thirds of the building. We have these contractors working, installing duct work, piping, uh, sprinkler piping, and uh, things of that nature. Interior framing and CMU, um, really the southern half of the building, most of those walls are constructed. A lot of the interior walls are block walls, um, and then we have metal frame walls as well. It, it's well along the way. In fact, even in the south area, as you can see, we've started interior painting. We have finished coats of paint on some areas of the building and uh, working, working through it. Ceiling grid installation, um, you know, ceiling grid for the acoustic tiles, we've got that in, in a, quite a bit of the building, really the classroom wings which allows us to put light fixtures and diffusers and just get uh, a higher level of finishes completed in the building. And then, as we had mentioned, uh, preparation for the stadium and the track is underway. So you can see this is a drone photo of the current uh, progress from January. Um, you know, from the outside of the building, you don't see a whole lot change right now from month to month because a lot of the work's happening in interior, but you can see uh, additional brick veneer that's taking place from the south side, which would be the left side of the screen is south, the right side's north. So uh, brick veneer is working south to north. Uh, all the dark black areas, the roofing membranes on, so those areas are dried in. Um, that's actually dry parts of the building. Last month, we had a bit of the steel decking that wasn't on, kind of around the auditorium, which doubles as a storm shelter. That's a black box near the top of the screen. So. Um, that's all installed. And over the next couple of months, you're gonna see a lot of the curbs and uh, drive lanes and parking areas coming in. So the site's really gonna start taking shape, uh, which will be exciting as well. So this next photo was last January. Um, and I think it really just tells the story. 12 months uh, ago, we had a concrete retaining wall. We had some slab, uh, concrete slab and some footings in. You can kind of see the footprint of the building. 12 months later, we've got what looks like a high school. Um, so just a ton of work put in place over the last 12 months. These are some photos of the exterior of the building. Um, so the blue, blue box in the background, that's the practice gym. Uh, the blue is the air barrier that's on it. Keeps the building dry uh, when it's final constructed, but allows it to breathe at the same time. And then on the forefront of the picture, you can see the hydromobile scaffold that the masons use and some brick veneer going up. And you can kind of start to see what the building's gonna look like with the multicolored brick and uh, the bands giving it some uh, detail, which is pretty exciting. This is an area, these are the classroom wings and the, that single story area is the industrial arts portion of the building. 
Um, here we've got a guy washing the brick. They, after the brick's installed, they wash it to get all the mortar residue off and uh, make it look great. So. This is one of the lower level classroom wings on the south side. We work south to north, so the south side of the building is more completed than the north side. Um, in this area, we've got final coats of paint on the walls. You can see the ceiling grid installed. Light fixtures are on. Uh, mechanical ductwork and piping is installed above the ceiling. And um, really, once we get some, um, some permanent cooling on, we'll start putting flooring and, um, and some more finishes in there. So. This is an upper level mechanical room. Um, it's exciting to some, not as exciting to others, but uh, these are all the hot water heaters for like faucets, kitchens, things like that. Um, pretty big heaters, so there's some tanks, and then kind of the heaters are actually almost like instant heat, but on a grander scale. And then those storage tanks store the water. It's an efficient uh, system for energy savings. So and then you can see some electrical switch gear in the background that's installed as well. This is the main mechanical room. Um, so this, there is just a ton of piping and work in this room. There's been guys working in here for months. Uh, this is where the chillers and the boilers go. The building it works off of a uh, chill water system, heating water system, which is really efficient. Um, and so all the piping and duct work and electrical systems throughout the entire building, we, we'd spent several months uh, going through this process, what we call BIM, it's uh, building information modeling. And what we did is we took the design team's design and then we basically shifted everything in 3D and built it in a model before we built it on site. Now, all this is measured in the model down to a 16th of an inch um, and we find conflicts is what happens. So you go through, you get conflicts, you can move everything. It's cheaper and faster to fix it in a 3D model than it is on site if you bring it out. So we spent several months going through um, all this stuff is detailed. The subs fabricate directly out of the model because it, it's so precise. And um, what's great is throughout the whole building, we've had no conflicts at all. And you can see the, the level of piping interaction and that uh, makes all that very uh, streamlined when it's installed. So let's see. So this is a video. Um, we're gonna highlight the industrial arts area and the mechanical room that we just talked about. So these areas in yellow, uh, kind of that L-shaped area is industrial arts. That box on the left is the mechanical room. This is what's gonna be the wood shop. Um, we're pretty far along. This will have exposed ceilings, which will be kind of, kind of nice. Um, the students will see all the duct work in the final design. You can see there's a lot of duct, uh, a lot of supply, a lot of exhaust, dusty area. So it's gonna keep that area clean. All CMU, concrete block walls throughout uh, for durability. Just a great space. This is an industrial tech classroom that's right adjacent to the wood shop. Um, all these areas have a lot of windows throughout, so it kind of opens up the space. You can see the adjacent students working, and um, it's just gonna be a great spot. And then from here, we're walking into the uh, office for that area. And again, uh, where the office is, there's windows that the, the teacher can see. Uh, all the students working and uh, they can see him and uh, et cetera. This is the main mechanical room. Um, so kind of a live view of the photo that we just looked at. You can see the uh, pumps. So all these red things are the pumps or pumps that'll move that water throughout the building, 400,000 square feet. So it takes some pretty large pumps to distribute this water. Um, and then these boxes are the boilers. They're kind of like instant heat as well, um, similar to the other ones. And then the stainless steel flue piping up through the, the roof. So yeah, just a great space. We had, in December, all the industrial arts students came out to the site and we took them on a tour. Um, we had a, a full curriculum for that day. Uh, hours one through seven came through. We took them out there. We answer, answered questions, talked to them about the trades. They got to see the space that they're going to use. And uh, it was just, it was an exciting day for everyone, I think. So that leads us to the dashboard. Um, you've been seeing the escalation allowance for some time. It's been holding steady at about $50,000 applied to that allowance. We just haven't really incurred that many costs that we've needed to uh, use the allowance for, which is great news for everyone. Um, the GMP build amount, uh, we're 51% build right now, which is appropriate for the, the phase of construction we're in. Um, yeah, the, the project's just going great. So uh, it, it's exciting. 
questions? Board? I just, uh, I noticed in some of the pictures all the, uh, the roofing curbs are up there. Any idea when they're gonna set the rooftop units? Yeah, so rooftop units start shipping uh, February 10th. Is they're gonna start shipping, the last one ships in May. There's 20, I think 20 rooftop units and some of them are custom so they're a little bit longer lead. But uh, yeah, so we should start setting those at the end of February. Any other questions, board? I just wanted to thank you and, and SM Wilson and all those involved. I've had a couple people report back to me just how smoothly things are going. And it's kind of unique uh, given the circumstances of post pandemic with uh, construction. So it sounds like everything's moving along and that's a, a lot of uh, progress in, in about 12 months. So uh, appreciate it. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. All right, board, on to the consent agenda. I'd like a motion to approve the consent agenda for January 19th, 2023, as presented. So moved. Second. Adam and Janet. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All, any opposed? Ayes have it. All right, on to uh, action item 10A, monthly financial report. Can I get a motion board, a motion to approve the December monthly financial report as presented? Second. Randy and Patrick. Any discussion board? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. All right. Motion passed. On to item 10B, purchases over 7,500. Board, I'd like a motion to approve the purchases over 7,500 as presented. So moved. Adam and Randy. Discussion board? I just have a question. Um, I'm looking over the uh, purchases over 7,500, and I'm not sure, um, I, I should have sent in a question on this, but on, on December 28th, we had a water line freeze and busted Hollenbeck, and there was an emergency um, purchase for repairing the pipe and stuff. I'm just curious uh, why we didn't use the preferred, our preferred district vendor on that. I'm not the vendor um, who was able to respond in a quick and timely, thank you. We went with the vendor who was able to respond in a, a quick and timely manner uh, with all of the situations going on. I'm not sure if the preferred vendor was able to respond at that time. It ended up being not just uh, plumbing, but they also had to rep replace some concrete and asphalt in the area because they had to do a lot of digging. Uh, they had to move equipment over to, to get everything here, get that repair made and be able to uh, open school. And so I know uh, working with our maintenance team, they tried to coordinate, make everything happen as quickly as possible on that. Yeah, well, I was just going over the itemized uh, bu uh, bill, I guess, and, and I see they had, you know, laborers, operators, stuff like that, but I didn't see an actual plumber on there for repairing the plumbing pipe. So that, that's all I have on that, but our preferred vendor on a different item they used for an emergency boiler replacement. So I was just curious, maybe they were busy. Um, I don't have the, the exact answer to that, but I could look into that and get back with you. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments, board? All right, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Ayes have it. Action item 10C, at board, I'd like a motion to approve change order number nine for the Francis Hall North Construction Project as presented. So moved. Second. Chad and Adam. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. Ayes have it. On to action item 10D. Board, I'd like a motion to approve the 2022-2023 revised budget as presented. So moved. Janet and Randy. Any discussion? All right. All right. 
All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. Oh, Mr. Sorry. Zingmar, we have a presentation oh, to sorry. address the revised budget. It's I thought okay I was getting in the no, I don't have to, anything. I would be fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll get this ready to present. So I'm going to do my best tonight to try to take a very complicated topic and make it as simple as I can and as easy to follow and understand. So uh, I just ask if there are any questions, please uh, bear with me as I shuffle paper, paper around. Um, I've uh, not only been working on the budget revision, but also budget projections for next year uh, this week. So um, the numbers may get crossed in my mind if it takes me a second to uncross anything. Um, being new to the Francis House School District, I would say that our budget is one of the um, most challenging budgets that I have ever had the opportunity uh, to behold. And uh, as a district, we're in a very unique place. Uh, I have phoned many friends who are financial experts uh, in the state and also who have financial expertise and support schools across the nation. And we're in a hard place as a district. Um, right now, we're in an okay place. Uh, we're going to talk about where we're at this year, what's brought us to where we're at this year, and then uh, just a little sneak preview about our future. So when we start out, just as a general overview, um, the budget, the revised budget this year is presented in a, a different format than you've seen previously. Previously, you've had a variety of uh, charts and, and tables, um, and I've tried to modify those charts and tables and also provide a lot of narrative to try to help explain what's going on in the charts and tables. And so if you have any questions after today, please contact me and I'll, I'll do my square best to answer any of them uh, that you might have. So the good news is right now, our anticipated end of year fund balances with the revisions are at 20.6%, uh, 06%. And that is within our range of 15 to 20% per board policy of what we would like to have for ending fund balances. Ending fund balance is kind of the magic number that tells you how healthy or unhealthy your, your school budget is. It's your, your kind of your running money, your operating money. It's, the, it's a reflection of what you have in your operating account, and, and that includes your teacher, the account that teachers are paid from. Teachers, classified staff, supplies, um, purchase services, everything except building projects is, is reflected in this number. Now, from my perspective, while 15 to 20% is, is the uh, number that we have as a board policy, to have enough money in the bank, because that, because that fund balance kind of represents your savings account, to have enough money in the bank to make payroll without taking out a loan, we need to have about 24% is our estimate. So at 20%, there's a very good likelihood that our cash flow will be such that we may have to borrow money to make payroll this next school year. So I just want to make sure everyone knows that. That's not unusual in schools that are more heavily locally funded. Um, that is a reality in, in many schools that have a heavy local funding base. Um, just as we think through that, um, we could have to do that as early as September, depending on how our cash flow works. Uh, we could have to borrow as much as $20 million, and it could cost us about $100,000 to do that. So that's kind of what we're thinking could be the worst case scenario in this be best case scenario, uh, fund balance of 20%. Some of the highlights you're going to hear tonight is that our revenues have increased this year, which is great news, um, over $9 million. Just keep in mind that of that over $9 million, that is coming from an increased assessed valuation due to one-time funding uh, of driven by the increase really in uh, vehicles and, uh, and other uh, personal property. Uh, state aid is, has allowed us to this year use what we call the pandemic provision. So typically we determine what our state aid is based on the three prior years. But because of the pandemic taking place, we're using our state aid all the way back to 2019-20. So our numbers are being uh, run on old data where we had more kids and better attendance than we have today. There's hope that that may, um, be, may happen in the future. Uh, we're waiting for announcements from uh, the state uh, to 100% confirm that. But we're hopeful we may get one more year of the pandemic provision. Uh, the numbers that I'm presenting to you tonight um, 
do not necessarily account for that, but there are a lot of other moving factors. So another important highlight, the expenses have increased about $1.8 million. Um, it is, is, it's super important to note in the expenses that vacancies are not taken out of this budget. Uh, if we have open positions, they're budgeted for because we don't know when we're gonna fill them, so we have to budget for them because they're on the list. So we, there may be a little bit of a reprieve uh, if some of those positions stay vacant throughout the year. We, I, I added this um, point it is not in the budget document, if you were to read through it, because the budget's a living document. It's a one snapshot in time and things keep happening and you discover revisions that need to be made. Uh, one of those revisions that needs, need, we need to make and will come in our uh, numbers next month, as we did not account for in the, in the numbers we're presenting to you today, a 2.37 million one-time um, impact when we made the switch from a, an accrual basis of accounting last year to a cash basis this year. So last year it was accrual basis. So basically uh, when we, the, the way that type of accounting works is we only ended up paying 11 months or showing on the books, 11 months worth of payment to the teacher retirement system. And the teacher retirement system, it's about $2.3 million a month that we paid it just for retirement for teachers. So last month we only paid 11 months Last year, we only paid 11 months. This year, we're gonna to have to pay 13. Then next year, we'll go back to normal. So that's a one-time blip on the radar. Um, also, we've had some, a few uh, increases with supplies and purchase services, but for the size of our $215 million budget, they're really not much at all. We've done a pretty good job in that area. Um, some considerations moving forward, and I'll, I'll try to make this more clear as we go through the presentation. If we took out all of the extra COVID-related money that we've received and we were to say, well, where would our fund balances end at the end of this year if all of that COVID money was gone? We would end at about 15%, factoring out that additional 2.37, 14%. So we would be at the base level of what is acceptable in our district for fund balances. So I just wanna make, that's kind of the big takeaway. If you don't hear anything else from the presentation, uh, remember those highlights. The budget summary, this chart is for the folks that love numbers. It, uh, the most important number at the bottom there again is where are we going to end? This chart is set up to look just like the ASBR. If you go online and you search Mo Desi ASBR Francis House School District, you can see years and years of data that we report to the state of what our numbers look. It's a number story of who we are, what we value, where we spend our money, uh, where 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 we where we invest our our hard-earned taxpayer dollars. Um, last year we ended at 21.25%. This year, we'll end somewhere between 19 and 20 percent um, with an anticipated end of year balance. That balance is made up of changes in revenue, which you can see. We have increases in local, county, state, and federal revenue. So that's great news. We're going to detail a little bit more where those uh, increases come from. That local money is coming primarily from that increased assessed valuation. We told you back it, when we talked about the uh, increased eval assessed valuation in the fall that we that overall it was about $4.8 million, but only a $3.22 million increase on the books. The reason you're only seeing $3.22 million on the books is because we'd already expected an increase. We just didn't ex in expect the level of increase that we received due to what happened with all of the vehicles. Um, it's also important to note that this is a 99.5% collection rate. So this is actually looking at both our delinquent taxes and our current taxes combined. We most, when we combine that annually, it's about 100%, so that's a, a safe number to recommend. Another big change that you're gonna see this year reflected is a reallocation of funding. So this isn't, the funding hasn't changed. This is tax money that we get in, but we're taking it. We have four accounts that we use. We have a general account where we pay like all of the classified staff and, and pay for supplies and purchase services. We have fund two, so that's fund one. Fund two, we're paying all of the teachers. Fund three, we're paying off our debt. Fund four we're, is called the capital account. That's where all of our bond money goes. And it's also, if we're gonna put a new roof on or pay the 
folks who fix that water line, that's where that money's coming. One of the things for our district that has been tricky um, is we don't have money scheduled to go into that account. We had about an $8.63 million budget, but we didn't have money scheduled to go in. Uh, so we would do a transfer at the end of the year, transfer about $6 million in, run in the hole, transfer money in, run in the hole. So it, it, the money's there, but it's just you're constantly kind of chasing your tail. So the idea with this is to, to start trying to have revenue streams that will deposit into that capital fund balance so that you have the money there to spend it as you need it um, and, and to, to build that up a little bit. Many school districts, um, most school districts our size when we look across the state, actually in addition to the 20% operating fund balance, will have a capital fund balance. The capital fund balance is what allows you to fix your roofs, put in a new HVAC unit, take care of your building and your facilities. We don't have a, a, a capital fund balance. We kind of live year to year, hoping that we have enough money in there to fix what's broken. And so that's something for us to work on long term as a, as a community. When we think about state money, that's been super interesting. Um, it, it, we have had an increase this year, a total special education high needs fund of about $4 million came through uh, the books. Typically we see about $2 million-ish uh, come in in special ed high needs fund. So we've had to increase this this year. The interesting thing about special ed high needs fund, those funds are, are set aside. If we have an individual child who needs a lot of support and we spend more than three times what we would spend to support a, a typical student, um, then that, which is called our per pupil expenditure, then the state get, reimburses you the following year for anything over three times your per pupil expenditure. So if we spend 36, 000, over $36,000 to educate an individual child, the state will pick up anything beyond that. So this reflects the state picking up the difference for us. It could come from state money or federal money. Um, Another very unique thing that happened this year from a state perspective, we had the, the pandemic provision, we talked about that, but we also had transportation was fully funded for the first time in I think many, 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 many years, <laughs> like maybe 20 plus years. So long ago that I've never really have any recollection of it ever being fully funded. Uh, when we say fully funded, what that really means is we turn in allowable miles, basically driving kids back and forth to school, not ball games, not field trips, just getting kids to and from school type of money. We turn in all of those expenses, and the state says, we'll full, fully fund, it, fund you at 75% of the total, um, but the other 25% is on you. Well, typically, they never really fully fund us at 75%. You might get 16% or on a good year, 33%. But this year, we really truly got funded at 75%. So that's exciting. But you'll, if you're going to the transportation roundtable, you'll learn more about the fact that um, we also lose some of that funding. A couple million dollars comes off the top of our fully funding because we're not efficient. So there's something uh, to explore there as well. But all of that said and done, we increased a total of 3.8, which we, from last year, and, and that's showing up here. And then the big kicker is the federal dollars. Um, $10.7 million on the books of open COVID-related funding. We have that COVID out, uh, that we have all of that going in and out as uh, revenue and expenditures. But after it's all said and done, about $4 million of that is being spent for salaries of existing staff. That's one of the allowable expenses. So you're seeing kind of an inflation of $4 million to our budget that is not normally here. It's, we're using COVID money to pay $4 million worth of teacher salaries. This next slide talks about changes in expenditures by object, and object's just a big uh, way to group things into big buckets. So all of these areas are going up too. We're bringing more money in, but we're spending more money. Not near as much, it's only 1.8 million more uh, compared to the nine million more we're bringing in. Where are those expenditures going? 85% um, of our overall budget is salaries and benefits. So we pay, that's most of our money goes to pay the people to do the work. And if you are going to try to save money, you can only buy so many fewer pu pencils, it starts turning into people. Or you have to have more money to spend. 
that's kind of where we're at as a district. We're going to either have to have more money to spend or, or spend less money. Um, we have a combined increase of uh, almost a million dollars in this area. 500,000 of that is uh, substitute cost. We've got a lot of increased subs over what we budgeted for. Um, we also did a mid-year classified salary adjustment. We were having such a hard time finding people to work. Uh, $1 extra for all of our classified staff per hour and 250 extra for our custodians per hour just so we could get people here to work and be competitive. And we still have work to do in that area. Um, it's, once again, I just want to say it is very likely that we will be able to offset this cost due to unfilled positions. Uh, we're working uh, together with HR and finance on getting our systems really tight so we could predict that on, a, on the fly, um, and it's a, a big project. This ex next area that we're talking about is uh, just taking a look, and, and these are really nominal, but I think worthy of note because if you count, if you watch your pennies and your dollars take care of themselves, uh, you know, $131,000 increase in purchase services and $309,000 in supplies. When you take a look at that, uh, a good chunk of, of some of this is related to some grant funding that has flowed that came in and, and increased budgets that we weren't expecting. Uh, additionally, some building budgets as we made the conversion to the new system, getting everybody's budget in right in the system, and also uh, some increased professional development needs and uh, technology subscription fees. Those just continually go up year after year uh, in every area. This next slide is just an overall summary of the budget. And uh, you can kind of see the total revenue change and total expenditure change by fund and then what that net difference is. And so as we wrap up, some words of caution. Um, if we think about that 20% and we were to back out the one-time revenue that we would lose with a $4 million extra in COVID, the $3.8 million in transportation, that puts us at 16.6%. This year, no raises, nothing changing, everything exactly like it is if that was not there. If we took out the additional uh, impact of, of, the, uh, of the money that we're getting from the state for state aid, about 3.5 million, that would bump us down to 15.13%. If we take out that additional 2.37, last year we were high, this year we're taking out 13 payments, we're down to 14%. And so we really need to be thoughtful as we build our budget for next year. Um, I give uh, great kudos to our principals and administrators. We've held steady on our staffing plan. We've held steady on our department budgets. Our building principals have held, held steady on the amount of supply. Uh, they've looked hard at how we could redistribute the supply money that we have uh, to create equity between buildings and make sure that all of our kids are getting a slice of that supply money uh, in, a, in, a, in a fair way. And so those are all things that, that we're doing already uh, to try to plan for the future. Um, just, I, I wanna revisit this. Everybody said, I don't know if you really need to tell people about it, but I, it's complicated and I wanna try to make it make sense for you. When you, we talked about that allowable transfer earlier, DESE allows us, they put a cap on how much money you can take out of operating and put into capital because they don't want you rat-holing all your money away to build buildings instead of paying people because the money's there to educate kids. So they put a cap on that, and for us, the cap will be about 8% when we combine all of our transfer options. We're budgeting here for a 6.6%, .6%, or not 8%, $8 million. Uh, we're budgeting here for a $6.6 .6 million transfer, which is a $600 increase over what was in the budget. Now, with the change of what we talked about with reclassification of the FIT and the m, &M tax and this transfer, we're gonna have a little extra built in, do, if we choose to go this way, we're gonna have a little extra built in to the transfer to take some of that one-time transportation money that we received this year, move it over into capital, thinking that that could potentially give us the option uh, to offset some of the cost for um, our transportation facility work, getting them moved in here to 4545 and all of the work related to that, and then maybe alleviate some of that off of the Prop S budget. We may, that 
that may or may not be a great idea, but the budget's built to allow us to do that. Um, dependent on the work of the Prop S groups going forward and the community input, we have the flexibility to not do that. But I tried to not let that look like there was an extra $2 million on the table if that's how we want to use it. We may choose to leave it in operating. Some hard decisions to be made. So just in closing, I would say there, you know, there are a lot of considerations and salaries, benefits, capital, our fund balances. Uh, lots of folks said take this slide out, but really this is at the heart of the decision of what we're doing. Like we've got to remember why are we here? What are we about? What are we trying to do? And to me, these considerations are all, con are, are all something that I think about whenever I'm working on the budget. Next steps. Um, in our office, we're doing a lot of work of just trying to improve our financial management system. Uh, we're 18 months into an adoption of an, our new system, Skyward. Um, we're one of the first in the state to, we are the first in the state to have the system Skyward. So the great thing about that is you get to help develop all the reports to be what you want them to. The bad thing is you have to develop the port reports to get them to be what you want them to. Um, but it's easier to work than a lot of systems because it's basically a giant database that you can pull numbers out of about anything you'd want to pull. Um, our goal is to get reporting set up so that we give you live data about your bond, the bond expenditures every month. Our goal is to get you revision, budget revision and transfer numbers every month. And to instead of waiting till the end of year or mid year to bring this to you, just as things happen to bring it bring it to you guys so you can uh, decide if we're going if you're okay with it and we can and we can account for that because we are we're having to watch things really close <laughs> we can't afford to be off by a couple million dollars um, gives you a little heart palpitation when you find out that that's what's going on and long range targets is just we we want to be competitive with salary and benefit planning we want the best teachers and the brightest teachers to come here stay here and leave other places to come to us <coughs> we want to have great buildings and we want them to look beautiful and uh, last uh, for years and years to come. And we want to have an effective operating and capital fund balance where we're not sweating bullets all the time, worrying that we're going to be able to make ends meet. We want to live comfortably like we would at our home. We don't want to run things on our credit cards to pay our bills and hope that we have enough money to make it till the next payday. Um, so in closing, uh, that is the budget revision that I have. And I would be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Board questions? Thanks, Dr. Hawk. Um, maybe I just want to try to try to follow along. Just wanted to maybe boil it down and see if I'm getting everything kind of correctly. Um, so what, what it sounds like is we, you're kind of saying we, we had a tough year uh, based on lingering COVID effects, based on maybe past decisions that, that have carried over uh, from previous years, but, but overall have done pretty decent for this year. Yep. Uh, that's been affected by one-time funding, which all schools got. Yes. Um, and we've done some good things within your department as well as the district as a whole to kind of manage those funds where we get to carry some of those over into next year. Um, yes. Yep. By by moving that funding through, we free up money that will give us a little more flexibility. Okay. Yes. And I guess I guess the next thing I'm hearing is uh, things don't get easier from here and potentially it's tough decisions, tough choices, things that we need to work through and plan for going forward. That would be 100% true. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I have, uh, and I'll just say, you know, I, I brought numbers to Ken, and I'm like, here's where I think we're in with revision. And he's like, run those again. I ran them again. You know, Try something that, like, I can't get them to run different. <laughs> it, it's, we're headed to a, on a hard place. Board, any questions? Any other questions, Board? I just wanted to, uh, I had a question too. Uh, you mentioned some kind of examples uh, about savings and uh, kind of relating that to the budget and just wanted to also point out because you talked about uh, possibly borrowing money to pay make payroll and whatnot. And so some of that complications from a school budget perspective is it's not like uh, homes or households where they get weekly paychecks or bi-weekly. Yes. We get large chunks at sporadic times throughout the year. And part of the other difficulties is also predicting what you're going to get in the future. Uh, and so that's also then complicated by we have to have these different fund buckets. And so some of the stuff you can put funds into and then not take out. And so 
Uh, there's a lot of different nuances from a, a school budget perspective to a household budget that just might not resonate with people when they hear uh, some certain things. Uh, some of the questions uh, that I had was, uh, I'm trying to recall and I was trying to look back as well, but that 24% ending fund balance, I'm not sure have we, when the last time we've ever had that amount? Because I... I think if I'm recalling correctly, we've only had to uh, take out of TANS one time since I think, I've been I here. I think we've taken out of TANS twice in recent history that I'm aware of. Um, and and things have fallen where that has worked. Um, when you pay your bills makes a difference. I, I believe that if our bills are due, we should pay them to the people that we owe money to at the time that they're due. Um, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot of ways to try to make things work when you don't have. You know, just like you would at home, if, if your house, if your if your house payments due and you don't have enough money in the bank, you might make a late payment. You know, so there's a lot of ways that ways that you can try to squeeze through. And as a with a district of our caliber, I think we should not be at a place where we're having to do that. And then the last question I had was the uh, retirement payments. You were saying that yes. 11 equal payments each year. Were we skipping a payment every year, or was that getting shifted to the next it, year, or how does that work to where we now have 13 payments instead of 11? So normally it would be 12 payments a year, and we pay we pay three pays at the end of the year, three teacher pays like in one pay batch, but because some of those pays don't go out until the next fiscal year, mm -hmm. uh, with accrual accounting, the way which year you put that payment on is different than the way you put that payment in a cash basis accounting. And so we've been accrual for years and years and years. And when we made that switch to cash basis, um, that was kind of one of those unintended consequences um, of making that switch. Really, that's that's the only one that has caught us, uh, caught up with us, uh, that we weren't factoring in. So and it's so not I, like money just is evaporating. It's just a different way. Yeah, of, like last year we didn't pay of, we didn't pay a month's bill. This year we had to pay two bills in January, so to speak, would be kind of the equivalent of what you'd do with that. It all balances out in the wash. It just makes it look like we had a 1% higher balance last year and a 1% lower balance this year, but really it would have all averaged itself out, sort of. Okay. So just that's a different a way question. of accounting for yeah. it. Okay. Just Any a different way comments, keeping the books. Comments, questions, board? And that was just a one time, right? After yep, this one year, time. once you do it next year, we'll be right back to just 12, yeah, 12, 12 payments every payments every month. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thank you guys for helping explain that because it is complicated a lot of this. <laughs> all right, board. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. Ayes have it. On to action item 10 uh, E. Board, I'd like a motion to approve vacation station and preschool tuition proposal as presented. So moved. Second. Adam and Randy. So in this uh, conversation, we're taking a look at the vacation station and, and our preschool programs that we have, which we have amazing, amazing after school care and amazing uh, tuition based and, and early childhood special education preschool programs in our district. It's a lot to be really proud of. Um, as with everything else, the costs keep going up, and so on the costs that are fee-based, we try to pass those those costs along to the parents who are paying for those fee-based programs. Um, we have a 1% increase in the preschool program scheduled and a 3% overall increase for vacation station. Um, that, that was a hard uh, decision to come to, uh, but our directors did a lot of hard budget work and feel like those increases should uh, hopefully make things sustainable throughout the year. If we see that we need to make any additional adjustments, they watch that bottom line closely and, and will bring that to us if changes are needed. Any questions or discussion board? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Motion carries. Board, I'd like an 
A uh, motion for action item 10F, motion to approve the 2324 staffing plan as presented. Adam and Patrick. Lisa. Thanks, Doug. I don't have anything to add today as we went through a full work session last month, but happy to answer any questions the board might have. Board, any questions? All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. Motion carries. Action item 10G. Board, I'd like a motion to reapprove the return to school plan as presented. So moved. Second. Adam and Randy. Board, this is the reapproval of the return to school plan that per federal guidelines, districts are required to approve every six months through September of 2023 related to the ESSER finance funding. There are no changes from the plan that was presented to you in July, which at that time we highlighted we were returning to all of our pre-pandemic policies and procedures within the district. Um, COVID continues to have a very minimal impact on our current operations, primarily just um, some student and staff attendance, and even that is much um, reduced. This plan does highlight, though, that we continue to have contingency plans and mitigation strategies in place should we have any spike within the district and we need to be responsive. Any discussion or questions, board? Okay. It looks like we're on to the work session, and Dr. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. <clears throat> All right, the ayes have it. Dr. Buckman. Leah, this is going to be the highlight of the board meeting. Are you ready? Get ready. <laughs> Uh, well, good evening. I'm excited to have an opportunity to share a little bit of an academic update with everyone tonight. Uh, David is joining me at the podium. David Brothers is our Director of Curriculum and Assessment. In his role, David works with Zach Braddy. Zach is our data analyst. And the two of them are the wizards that obtain and analyze all of our academic data for the district. He's also our internal MSIP 6 expert, uh, which we'll kind of highlight tonight. So. I just want to honor them because while I'll do all, most of the talking tonight, all of the charts and the graphs and the data you see, that is really a product of their hard work each day. So um, we're lucky to have them. So as you know, Dusty has moved from MSIP 5 to MSIP 6 as their accountability system. And under this new system, districts will be measured against our performance metrics, which really measure student outcomes, and then also our continuous improvement metrics, which assess the quality of the work um, of a district towards improving opportunities for all of our students. And all of that information is what's used for our annual performance report, or the APR, uh, which informs accreditation and classification of, of districts. And so the performance metrics that you see on the slide here, that makes up 70% of our APR. And then the continuous improvement metrics, that makes up the other 30% of our APR. We'll talk more in depth uh, about MSIP 6 at a future board meeting. Typically, when I come to you and I share the data, Desi has released everything and they've issued our APR. Uh, this year's a little different. As you know, Desi has recently released our status data. That was uh, district communications. And that really is how our students scored last spring on those end of course exams and the MAP test. Um, however, they haven't released the growth data yet. So that's why you see that yellow line through that uh, square up there. We expect that to come in the spring. That's kind of the best estimate Desi's given us. And so once we have that data, we'll come back and we'll share the growth data with you. I uh, just wanted you to know why we don't have that tonight. So tonight, what we will talk about is all of the areas of the performance metrics where we do have the data. Um, so we'll look at status, how our kids scored in the spring. We'll look at overall, and then we'll also look at our student group performance. Uh, we'll take a look at success ready. That takes a look at the college and career readiness assessment. So for us, we'll look at our ACT data. And then it also looks at student completion of advanced coursework. And so for us, we'll take a look at some of our advanced placement data tonight. And then our graduation rate, how many of our students are graduating in four years or five or more years, and then also our graduation follow-up. And that's what are our graduates doing six months or about 180 days after they leave us. Um, one thing I do want to mention before we get started is that I've said Desi hasn't released all the data yet. We do have our MPI scores for our students, which is usually what we bring you in this presentation. However, we don't have access to the MPI scores of other districts yet. 
And so in the past, we know that there's a lot of value in our community of seeing how we stack up against other districts. We kind of benchmark ourselves uh, against some consistent districts each year. And since we don't have the MPI scores of those districts, that was gonna be a little challenging to do. What we were able to do is take a look at the percent proficiency of our students. So how many students are scoring in that advanced proficient range and use that as our comparison across districts. So it is a little bit of a different um, measurement that we're bringing you this year. And we anticipate that that's really just a one year change. We should be able to be back to MPI scores next year. Um, now in full transparency, there is a chance that mathematically um, we believe mathematically this will correlate to the MPI scores. So the charts you see, we think that that's probably how the charts will shake out as well when we get MPI scores. But there is a slight chance that things could change a little bit on some of those comparison graphs. So um, we don't anticipate that, but I don't want to lead you astray if I'm wrong. All right, so let's switch over and take a look at our ELA score. Or we'll actually we'll start with our combined proficiency. So. This chart shows our overall map and EOC performance. So this is our ELA, our science, our social studies, and our math all combined into a single data point. And so you could think of it kind of like a summary of all of our assessments together. Uh, you can see by the chart, we have the highest percent of proficient students when you look at all of the other districts in St. Charles County and also <coughs> the three St. Louis County districts that we always use as our benchmarks. Um, I'd also note that we have a little over 20% more students proficient than the state average. Um, obviously, this is a huge point of pride, and our teachers are phenomenal. I mean, these are scores to celebrate from the rooftops. Uh, we'll start by breaking that down and looking at each area individually. So we'll kick it off with our ELA scores. Uh, map and, this is our MAP and EO, uh, EOC test. This is what our students in grades three through eight take, as well as English two, which is typically 10th grade. Um, the chart on the left shows you our overall student performance, and then the chart on the right shows the performance of students in what the state calls our student groups. The yellow highlight shows how we performed as a state compared to our, or not as a state, as a district, uh, compared to the other St. Charles and St. Louis County districts that we typically benchmark. And then it's a little hard to see, but one of those rows is shaded. And that gray shaded row, that's the state average. So if you wanna kind of compare us to the state average, um, you'll be able to see that up there. One thing I'll mention is that the version of the presentation that's posted in Board Docs, it does have a few extra slides that go into an additional layer of detail. Uh, than what I'm sharing with you tonight. So if you were to look at what's in board docs, you would see uh, similar information for third grade, for fourth grade, for fifth grade, for each breakdown, for those that are interested in, in that additional layer of detail. Uh, and then we'll switch over to math. So this one shows math. This is grades three through eight. It's algebra one and then also algebra two. And again, the chart on the left shows overall student performance and the chart on the right shows our student group performance. Um, and once again, you can see that we outperform the state and all of our peers. Uh, and just like ELA, the math breakdowns are also included in the um, presentation that's posted online. I will pause here. There's been a lot of conversation, especially about Algebra 1. And so I uh, just want to take a minute to talk a little about that. If you were to look at the detailed slides, you would see that we saw gains in Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, gains that we're very proud of. Both of those yielded more than 20 MPI gain point gains, which is certainly to be celebrated, and we believe we're on the right track with the work that we're doing. Um, at the same time, when we look at our Algebra 1 scores, we acknowledge that we do think that we could be performing better and, and know that our students uh, could be performing better. So one thing I want to point out, we've talked about it in some different committees. Um, if you are to compare the Algebra 1 scores across districts, something to keep in mind is that there is a little variance in how districts assess. And so we know a couple local districts have students take their Algebra 1 EOC after they've taken Algebra 2. And so that extra year of Algebra would certainly <coughs> impact their score on that Algebra 1 EOC. Uh, we follow the DESE guidance and we give the Algebra 1 EOC after students take Algebra 1. And so when you're comparing districts, it's important to note that those scores could be higher because the students had a whole nother year of algebra before they took their Algebra 1 EOC. So just something to keep in mind if, if you're getting into that level of detail. Uh, regardless, we still believe our scores could be higher than what we currently see. We've met with the districts who are outperforming us. We've had conversations to try to figure out is there something different that's happening or uh, what can we learn from your success just like we do every year. We've had 
an immense amount of internal collaboration around it, and all of that resulted in some intentional work this year uh, that we hope would impact those Algebra 1 scores. Uh, we know we're on the right track. Our, our gains from last year to this year would indicate that, and we want to see that growth continue. So uh, David is his team, he and his team, and then I would also give a little shout out to Dr. Lammers is our director of secondary. They're really working with that PLC of teachers, and David's going to share a little bit about some of the highlights of what that work looks like. Yeah, like doc, Dr. Buckman said, when, when we want to become better, we look at what those better performing districts around us are doing, and also internally, what, what else is working. And so when we look at what some of the higher performing districts are doing, um, they're assessing their students intentionally more often. And if I look, compare that to what we do at our elementary and middle school levels, we do something similar with our benchmark assessments. So um, over the summer and first semester, um, we created common unit assessments in Algebra 1 aligned to the most current DESE priority standards. And then once those assessments have been created, then um, we're working with PLCs, the Algebra 1 PLCs, to have conversations about what, what is the data saying, where our students' strengths are, where our student weaknesses are, and then having mean, meaningful conversations around that data to purposely plan instructional next steps. Um, whether it is our content leader, um, our director of secondary, and myself, we are all here to support our PLCs and um, help them drive that conversation and, and really focus on what is going to look, what are, what are the ways that we're going to improve student performance and instruction in the classrooms. One of the first things that we do, though, is, and, and, and I'm a data nerd, um, very early on in when we get our data back, we get something called IBD data, which lets us know how students did on individual standards that were assessed on the Ultra One EOC and other EOCs as well, and then how often that particular standard was assessed. We create something called a heat map, and that allows us to see the impact of how students score on a particular standard and how much, how often it's tested. Um, so we have PLC conversations with each of our Algebra 1 PLCs around that data, so we know exactly where those areas of improvement are going to be. Throughout the school year, um, our secondary math and science content leader, um, some academic directors, as well as our building administration, are constantly constantly providing strategic support um, for Algebra 1 teachers, including some release time to go over those common assessments. Our content leader continues to provide instructional coaching to our math teachers, and in particular, our brand new math teachers that are teaching Algebra 1. And something else that we're going to do um, this school year is we are adding a practice Algebra 1 EOC that we'll get data from about a month prior to the EOC, so we can see pretty um, summarily where our students are at and have about a month to take action on the data that we're seeing around very specific standards. Thanks, David. We'll switch over now to science. So we've talked about ELA, math. Uh, science is the third of the fourth areas that we'll look at. This includes our fifth grade, eighth grade, and biology student data. Something that's unique here about science is both the fifth grade and the eighth grade assessments are what they call grade span assessments. And so that means that fifth grade covers the standards from third, fourth, and fifth grade. And the eighth grade test covers the standards from sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. It's not just a one-year um, assessment. A little unique. Um, so once again, on the left, you'll see how all of our students performed. And then on the right, you'll see our student group performance. And like the previous two areas, uh, so much to celebrate there in where we're performing comparatively. And then finally, we'll take a look at social studies. And so this one is also a little unique in that it's only one assessment, uh, where all of the others are a combination of multiple different assessments. This is just the government EOC. It was a new assessment last year, so this was just the second year um, of taking it. And uh, it's typically junior year that our students would take that EOC. And so we did see a gain compared to our scores from last year. Uh, while we outperform the state, we certainly would like to see a little bit of growth here. Uh, you know where we like to fall on those charts, uh, especially for our students who fall in that student group cohort. We've got a little work to do there. So you might notice if you look at the student group chart that a couple districts don't have an, a number, um, and that's because they have such a small number of students who fall in that category um, that that data isn't shared out. Much like algebra, our social studies content leader is working with our government teachers to make sure we have those common assessments that are aligned to state standards. 
Um, they're utilizing some technology enhanced assessments with the goal of resembling the EOC uh, questioning methods, so ordering, labeling, drag and drop, sorting, matching, things like that. Uh, the goal is really that our kids understand the content as well as the testing methods that are used on the EOC so that they're, they're best prepared. And then they're taking the data from that assessment, it's kind of like David talked about, and making some instructional decisions as they collaborate during that weekly PLC time. Um, really, they're trying to get at what's the root cause and what, uh, what strategic and intentional work do we need to do to, to adjust at the building level and then at the district level, where might we find some potential gaps in curriculum or resources that we provide that will help us get those little gains there. Um, I might mention here, AP government did get a new resource this year that better aligns with the AP government test, um, which is different than the EOC, but just a little point of information. All right, so we'll switch over to our second indicator tonight, success ready students. So once again, this measures students' readiness for the next phase career. Is that me or did that say that? Okay. <laughs> um, so for this indicator, DESI measures two things. They take a look at our performance on college and career assessments. So that would be the ACT, the ASVAB, the um, ACT work keys. And they also take a look at participation in advanced academic or career oriented um, experiences. So for us at AP, advanced placement courses is what we'll, we'll take a look at. Um, oh, I think I skipped. We'll start with ACT performance. So this is just one of the assessments that students can use for that CCR assessment uh, need. However, it's most popular among our student body. It's what the, the vast majority of our students take. So that's the data that we'll take a look at. This slide shows the ACT composite data that's given to us directly from ACT. We receive ACT data and then or, uh, data from ACT. We also receive different data from DESE. This is the last ACT score that is on file for a student. It's not necessarily the highest score. That's what we get from ACT, the last test they took. However, uh, DESE provides the highest score regardless of when they took it. Um, and what's unique is that this year our composite is actually exactly the same whether you look at the last test students took or the highest test on record. That's usually not the case. I know, Jason, I'm not doing anything, but if I can fade in and out, okay. Um, what else do I want you to know? You can see that we outperform both the state and the national numbers there, the, the dark, dark navy and lighter blue um, boxes. Something to consider if you were to compare ACT scores among districts, we elect to test the large majority of our students. So unless they're taking the work keys or map A, all of our kids are taking ACT. There's some other districts, uh, local St. Charles County districts, that currently don't test all of their juniors. Um, Rockwood is one of our comparison districts. They do test all of their juniors, so they would be a, a district that we could compare to in terms of how many students are included in those numbers. Regardless of how you look at the data, we agree. We have some work to do when it comes to our ACT scores. We certainly believe that as a district, especially when you look at all of our other data points, we should be performing um, better on the ACT. There's, there's no question about that. We've spent a considerable amount of time with some internal conversation, analyzing variety of data points, um, talking with other districts to try to figure out what is the root cause that's causing the drop over time. Uh, we know a few things to be true. Our data, our internal data clearly indicates that the frequency in which students take the ACT, so how many times do I take that test, that there's a direct impact on their score. Uh, we also, in looking at our data, can tell, you can choose when we give the ACT to our juniors, you can choose what month you do that. And we, we do think that the timing impacts the score. There seems to be a correlation there. So um, David, again, is going to talk a little bit about some of those internal steps that we're taking to address the ACT to, to get that score back up to where we believe it should be. And something um, unique that we're doing this year is we are piloting um, two programs, one IXL and one um, ad minimum test packs that students take an actual ACT and then they are prescribed practices based on their score and with test packs in particular, even prescribed lessons that they can watch that um, will help ideally in improve their skills before they take the ACT. Um, in addition, um, Dr. Buckman just me mentioned, we, did, we conducted an um, in-depth analysis of the coursework that our students are taking. And we compared that to what ACT recommends as a, a course pathway that would best prepare students for college. So for instance, we looked at, by our freshman year, 
for the most part, our students are right on track taking the courses they need to take um, to be best prepared for college. But by the time they get to their sophomore year, we're noticing not all of them are taking the prescribed math pathway, Algebra 1 into Geometry and Algebra 2 and Pre-Calculus. Um, if we look at towards our junior year, we have noticed that um, students are not accessing the science pathway that, we, that ACT would tell you, this is what's gonna best prepare a student um, in science, which would be at biology, chemistry, and physics. So things that we have done is make sure that those ACT prep courses are highlighted in our course guide so families can make more informed decisions, as well as helping counselors understand and then helping counselors have conversations with students during course enrollment time about these are the courses that probably will best prepare you for college. Dr. Buckman also uh, measured, and I, I've looked at ACT a lot of different ways, but one of the sig most significant things that I found is that over the last five years, the number of times a student has taken the ACT has, has dropped considerably. Um, an example is um, in prior school, in about 2018, probably about half of our students would take an ACT uh, at least two times, and that's dropped down to about 30% of our students. Um, what research would tell us, and if you would even look at our internal ACT data over the last five years, it would tell you the same thing, that yes, there is a considerable jump the more often that students take the ACT. Uh, things we're doing is we're bringing back um, a practice AT ACT for our sophomores which will give students at least one more opportunity before the real test to see what in the ACT is like. Um, and also trying to help families understand the importance of taking the ACT multiple times. And if you don't know, recently ACT has in instituted a super score, which if a student takes the ACT multiple times, they get a super composite that takes their highest math, their highest ELA, their highest reading, their highest science scores, and calculates a composite that way. And so help, um, a communication campaign to help families understand that with that super score, that really is going to help your overall composite. Um, we're in the process of building a crosswalk between ACTS standards that we can look at and say in math, here are the standards that a student needs to master to get between an 18 or 21 on the ACT, or between 21 and 24 to meet these standards. We're looking at that, that, um, those standards compared to our curriculum and building a crosswalk um, and helping our teachers understand what that crosswalk's, um, the, the purpose of it and how to best use that with their students. Um, for the last three years, we have had to give our junior AC during the early spring administration because the later date happened on a non-school day. So this year, um, talking because it, the later date in April actually is a school day for us this school year, we had conversations and we're moving to test students during that later date. And then finally, we've conducted an analysis of our student groups and compared their ACT scores. And we do know that we have several student groups that are underperforming um, where our all student group is. And we're trying to work with uh, buildings to make sure we provide the best possible support for all of our students and in particular those student groups. Thanks, David. Uh, all right, we'll switch over to AP, which is the second of those indicators under success ready students. And so this is that participation in advanced academic or career oriented experiences. So for this indicator, we'll take a look at our AP classes. We know on average about 80% of Francis Hall students graduate and choose to go into college. Our goal is that all of those students are taking at least, they're accessing a college level course before graduation. For most of our students, that's through our AP offerings. Some of our students choose to do uh, like our early college program or one of the other options. Um, Currently, we have about 54% of our students who take at least one AP class before graduation. So our goal is that all 80% of those kids would be taking a, a class. We'll continue to work towards that. We offer a wide range of AP classes. You can take anything from AP Calc to AP Art and Design. Um, so there really is something for everyone. We also know that success in AP indicates that a student is at that reading and writing level that allow them to be successful if they choose to go right into a career field. And so one thing that we know that we wanna work on is dispelling the myth that AP classes aren't for kids who plan to go right into the workforce. It, there's a, a myth that it's just for college-bound students and that's not the case. Um, so 
Regardless, this chart here, if you take a look at it, the um, I have to look at it on my screen, it's a little bigger. Uh, the blue bar shows students who took the AP test, and then the number of exams that were written is what you'll see on that yellow bar. So we saw a little bit of an increase in the number of students who took an AP test, uh, also an increase in the number of exams that were written last year. And then the last piece of data I'll share with you from AP is how our students scored on the assessment. So this slide shows in blue the percent of kids who scored a three or higher on at least one exam, and then the yellow bar yellow bar shows the percent of exams where kids scored um, a three or higher. You can see we saw a little decrease, about 2% uh, in both of those numbers. All right, our next indicator is graduation rate. This is the, uh, we're scored on um, how many, the percent of our kids that graduate in four years. We also get points for kids who graduate in five years and beyond. And so this slide shows both our four-year and our five-year graduation rate. Um, I'm going to have you follow along with me. If you look at the 2018 column and then you look at the four-year graduate rate row, you'll see that 95.8% of our students graduated in four years. And then if you take that box and you move on a diagonal, you'll see that we picked up some additional students and we ended at 97% of that class in the fifth year. So that means that there was just a small group of students who needed an extra semester or two to complete those graduation requirements. One of our points of pride in the district is that we typically earn all of our points for graduation on our four-year grad rate. Uh, many other districts need that fifth year in order to earn all of their points. Um, our grad rate is certainly a, a point of pride in our district. Um, if you were to look at the Francis Hall data for 2021, the, the, that class, uh, you'd see that we had 96% of our kids graduate in four years. And then if you follow that down on a diagonal, we were able to bump that up to a little over 97% by the end of that fifth year. Uh, that compares to the state average of 89, bumping up to 91. So uh, doing well there. And then our final indicator is our graduation follow-up. This is uh, the extent to which our students are pursuing gainful opportunities after graduation. And so we earn points for kids who are enrolled in college, at a trade or a technical school, employed, or in the military. Uh, those are the four areas that, if, if it's not one of those four, uh, it, we don't earn points for it. <laughs> and so uh, this data comes from six months out. We have to do a 180-day survey. You may hear that language. And it's tracking down kids 180 days after they've left us and ask them what, what it is that they're doing. Um, and so as you can see from our data, we hover around 80% of our students attending a two-year or a four-year <laughs> college. Um, and then we consistently have about 13% of our students who go right out into the workforce. So all of that said, we always like to wrap up with some conversations around celebrations and then also how we'll continue to grow. So a few things to highlight. When you look at our combined proficiency, that was that very first slide that we shared, we're the highest achieving district in St. Charles County and among our benchmark peers that we look at in St. Louis County. Uh, when you look at the actual proficiency scores for each specific tested area, every single area showed an increase over last year, every single one, um, every grade, every EOC, which is amazing. Um, we developed and implemented some common assessments in all of our high school EOC tested areas to align with our state standards. Both Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 saw gains over 20 MPI points. Our Algebra 2 data is actually the highest it's been in four years. Uh, we've been working to integrate phonics into our elementary classrooms. We, we've completed what COVID turned into a multi-year PD plan uh, to allow for that implementation. We've made strides in our work to balance college and career, and lots of new opportunities are available to students, especially in that career field. All of our elementary buildings have a leadership team that's engaged in a professional learning community academy, and it's getting rave reviews. Um, and all of our secondary staff is engaged in learning around assessment. Uh, we're successfully transitioning to MSIP 6, developing lots of new systems to ensure that we're meeting all those performance expectations and continuous improvement metrics. Um, I would tell you that I'm, I'm part of the group at the state level who's scoring the MSIP, the CSIPs for other districts, and we, are, we have lots to celebrate when I look at the the documents from other districts across the state, uh, we have much to be proud of. Um, we continue to collaborate with other districts uh, just through professional networks. I think one of my points of pride when I think about how we collaborate with other districts is so often it's our leaders, our staff that are initiating that collaboration. 
Uh, we're establishing professional learning networks. We're reaching out to other districts and asking to set up those conversations. And so uh, the collaborative nature among our staff, I think that goes all the way up through our organization, which is the PD in me loves to see that. Um, and at the same time, we know that we always have room to grow and always get better. When people ask me what I love about Francis Howell, it's that spirit of continuous improvement that uh, keeps my heart happy. Um, and so in that, we certainly have work to do. Um, We've been working with our high school leadership teams to add the two trials for the different AT ACT supports that David talked about. So monitoring the data around those trials so we can figure out what would be the best one to scale and potentially implement fully next school year. Uh, we're planning to implement the practice ACT in the spring to our 10th graders and then work with our buildings to figure out the best way to use that data. Um, we've also been more intentional about making sure that students are in the classes that'll best prepare them for the ACT, which David highlighted. Our content leader and building leadership team is providing really intentional support to our Algebra One teachers through some of that instructional coaching, the PLC conversations, and then that assessment data analysis all aligned to the standards, which we believe should impact those EOC scores. Every one of our schools has developed an improvement plan that's targeted on specific work that aligns to the unique needs of that building that are surfacing in their data. And then members of, of our team, the academic team, we visit with those buildings to to review, to monitor, and support the plans of all 23 sites, and we do that twice every school year. Uh, we're continuing to learn about Senate Bill 681. That's the new bill that outlines the specific expectations in the area of literacy and make adjustments to those plans to ensure we're meeting the expectations. Uh, we'll talk more about that during our upcoming work session. We know that the career readiness side of the house still has lots of opportunities to grow. We continue to look for ways that we can offer programs and opportunities within our current staffing and budget um, allowances. Uh, we're planning to expand the PLC Academy next school year to our secondary buildings, and then we'll continue that assessment-focused professional learning as well. And then, just as always, continuing to look for opportunities, collaborate with other districts um, in our area, and then Dave and I have been having some conversations lately about even benchmark uh, Kansas City, Columbia, benchmark districts outside of just the St. Louis region. Uh, you know I can't end without giving a shout out just to the heartbeat of our district. So it is harder than ever to be an educator. The needs of our students are ever-changing. The pressures on educators are new and different, and uh, it feels like more every school year. And at the same time, our staff continues to show up day after day and perform at extremely high levels. They are doing amazing things for our students every single day. And it's evident every time you walk into a building, every time you walk into a classroom, um, you see it. Um, our staff is passionate about their students. They work tirelessly to do whatever it takes to make sure all of our students have everything that they need. And so just regardless of the seat in which they sit, our employees are really the ones that contributed to the celebrations and the successes that you saw tonight. With that, David and I are happy to answer any questions or we've got the team back there. Yeah, I had a uh, couple questions. I definitely want to say though that I appreciate the uh, condensed version. We didn't need to break this up to two different meetings. And uh, I tried. I feel so like I'm... that's much appreciated, but also the transparency as well, also providing that extra information so that some of the detractors out there can't say that we're trying to hide something or cherry picking information. So I appreciate the sure. extra transparency and also uh, acknowledging that there's some room for growth. Uh, the, Again, much appreciated, and a lot of that hard work and those uh, numbers that we do need to celebrate are uh, direct results of just the work that's put into it from the teachers that you acknowledge, but also the parents and the students that are a part of that. Uh, I, I also want to also acknowledge that we have these high numbers, high achieving numbers, and we just talked about the struggles that we have financially here in the district. So. There, I just don't know how sustainable that is with those high achieving numbers without community support. So I just want to speak to that and kind of put pe that thought in people's minds that there has to come a time to where we support uh, the school district so we can continue to do the, uh, the great things that we've always been doing and somehow managing to get by at such high levels. Uh, one question for uh, Dr. Brothers here. Uh, you said super score with ACT. Right. Any number, uh, what's the magic number to achieve for that comprehensive score? Do you know? Well, the, the top score is still 36. Okay. So, and then colleges. I mean, the amount of times you have to take it to get that comprehensive. 
Score. I don't. I, I will have to pull research okay. for you. It's brand new, so I don't know the magic number of times. But with our internal data, I can say about the fourth or fifth time is where our students are maxing out on gains. So if you were to compare our internal students, and if they take it a sixth or seventh or eighth time, they're not moving the needle much more beyond that. Okay. Thank you. Board, any other questions, comments? Gina? <laughs> First of all, thank you, Dr. Buckman, for that presentation, and Dr. Brothers. I really appreciate the fact, like uh, Mr. Zigmeyer said, that you you recognize where we're lacking and where we need what we need to do to make that. And I think everyone, I know for me personally, I go ahead. I really appreciate that that you recognize where we need to make better choices in our for our kids so thank you very much second of all I was just thinking poor Leah she's had budget and <laughs> academics in one night I'm just making sure she's still awake here and she's doing great so um, I just want to say that Leah do you have any questions no you okay that was a lot of data you just got <laughs> thank you again David you may have answered this or Connie for all of us, what is student group? We know all students, but next to it is student group. What does that mean? It's our uh, students who have an IEP. It's uh, free reduced lunch. It's uh, black, Hispanic, English learners. It used to be called our super subgroup. So when I said five, it was super subgroup. They've changed the language to student group. And when we're, me when we're measuring student group progress, um, a student might be in several categories, like free and reduced lunch and black, but for accountability pur purposes in that student group, we're only held accountable for that student one time, even if they're in multiple subgroups. Correct. And I, and I knew that, but I don't think the oh. audience knows. Sorry. What do you mean Good the point. student group? Is it you know, all the ones we like or don't like? And, and secondly, <laughs> you know, people ask about scores and why aren't districts doing even better. The frustration we have as an educator and as a board member you just heard our NEA president congratulate us on finishing the first semester. And that's wonderful. And we're just getting these scores. How do you make improvements? How do we expect those teachers to make improvements when they're not getting the information of they were strong here, this worked, we need to improve upon. And that's something that we need to meet with the state on, that we need to get these scores back in a timely manner. In September, if we're weak in phonics, only because you mentioned that, that school knows we need to work on phonics. And this school over here may not be phonics, it may be comprehension. So what is one of those moving targets that we've been frustrated with for years, that all this information is wonderful and it's come out and we have it January 1st, half the school year is over. And so it's something that state needs to change. And thank you. Patrick, I will mention just in full transparency, we have had the scores for a little bit. They've, they're embargoed and we can't publicly talk about right. them until uh, December, it was like a week before our last board meeting when they uh, went public uh, without much notice. And so right. we're just bringing them to you. Our teachers have, our, our buildings have had them for a little bit of time. So I don't want you to think the buildings just got them in January. Know, yes, it wasn't much before. Know, yes, that's fair, very fair. Board, any other comments? Adam? Thanks, Dr. Buckman, uh, Mr. Brothers. Uh, there's a lot of conversation historically about like the gaps from COVID and this, this makes it sound like we, we're improving. Um, so encouraging. So just I want to thank you for all the hard work there and all the hard work and slicing and dicing the data and digging <laughs> into it. Um, sounds like a whole lot of work you, you guys were doing, the team was doing. So I appreciate all that. Thanks. Great. I appreciate it. Just want to say, uh, David and, and Connie, uh, for the presentation and also meeting with me, uh, just a lay person uh, at the beginning of January for quite a while and uh, talking about a lot of this already. Um, one of the things I know we talked about there was um, one of my questions was what incentives you know do students have to do well on the MAP test? Um, and, and you pointed out that, this, that our school district, off, you know, teachers do their own little thing, but um, there are some incentives there for the students to do well. Uh, whereas with the ACT, obviously their in, their incentive is to uh, get accepted to the college of their choice. Um, that said, I don't know if you mentioned it, but I'll just mention it to the public. Uh, some colleges now aren't requiring the ACT. Um, you can still submit it. That's a whole another topic. You can search on your own on the internet if you're interested. But um, that may have an impact. Um, I'd have to compare with our surrounding districts to see if theirs went down accordingly. But um, something to something to consider. Um, 
With respect to MAP scores and um, social studies sticks out. So I, I'm just curious, is there a, have we had a, a lot of social studies teachers leave? Did we do a new textbook? Is there anything there that kind of jumps out or do you think it's just, we just need to work a tad harder? I, sorry, I should have put these no, in No, that's in okay. Advance, I don't yeah. know if, I don't know if we've no, had a lot okay. of social studies turnover. Um, I, it's the second year of an assessment of that assessment. Um, David might be able to talk more about it. I think in the past it was a little more like trivia and it's a little less like that now. Um, okay. We did see some gains from last year to this year and so we believe that the work they're doing, again, we're, we're on the right track with that. Um, I don't know that I have an answer to those though. I'm yeah, I, I know you guys knew the data much better than me and, and all the questions I had, you already, uh, you already knew where the, uh, you know, where the room for improvements were. Uh, and I'll just say, you know, this, you, you touched on it, but in the detailed slides for the public, um, you can see this Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 uh, thing that, that you kind of alluded to, but um, I'll say something a little more about it. The, there are schools, um, and we're to believe here that school districts like Rockwood, uh, Fort Zumwalt, had no students that took Algebra 2 last year. Um, I, uh, that's suspect to me. They have their high school students take Algebra 1. Um, if, if uh, I suppose you can talk a little bit about how that testing works, but I think it's important for the um, for the, the general public to understand. But uh, some some students take algebra one in middle school. Uh, those students that are in uh, pre-algebra and algebra in seventh and eighth grade, um, and then in high school they're required to take one math assessment. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so those students ideally should take uh, algebra two when they get to high school or geometry, but uh, is the thought that these other districts are having their seventh and eighth grade algebra students take the eighth grade EOC end of course? Is that? The, the, or we yeah, don't all know. eighth graders have to take a math assessment, uh -huh. and so if they're not giving their algebra one middle schoolers the algebra one EOC, then yes, they'd be giving the eighth grade um, grade level assessment map test. Yeah. Okay. I I would also mention I don't want to throw other districts under the bus. The the local districts in St. Charles County, some of that is an impact of COVID and how they chose to, to navigate COVID in their district. So uh, while there's always been a little bit of inconsistency, um, I do think Desi's been pretty clear with their guidance around MSIP 6 and that their expectation is right test, right time. So when you take the class, you take the EOC. And so we're very hopeful that moving forward, we will see some consistency in the testing. I don't, I, I'd like to believe nobody's trying to play the system, that it was just kind of how they navigated um, some COVID-related decisions in their district. We put it out there because we know that there's a lot of comparison between districts, and mm -hmm. it's not always apples to apples, and so um, it's just a point of fact that we want people to know when they're comparing. Yeah. But I don't think it was ill intent on other districts, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I hope not, but it, it does stick out when you look at when you look at the detailed data. Um, it, you can't help but notice it. Um, so appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Board, anything else? Thank you, Dr. Buckman, Thanks, Dr. Brothers. On to superintendent comments. Board, first, I would like to echo the thanks. Um, both for Dr. Hawk and Dr. Buckman and their departments and the works on the revised budget and that information presentation tonight, as well as the academic report. When I think about the two areas that our patrons and our staff have the highest expectations for us, um, it's about fiscal responsibility and sharing that information and being transparent, and then the work that we're doing to prepare our students for post-secondary opportunities, whichever they may choose. And that comes back ultimately to our academic offerings. We look at the reports and the information other districts provide um, to their boards and to their patrons patrons through their meetings, and we really provide a greater level of detail than many other districts do, both around our budget as well as around our academic report. And I point that out only because we have spent a lot of time this year trying to be more transparent and clear with the data, and just want to remind people that we get a lot of great questions from our staff, from our patrons, and from you related both to our academic achievement, the work, the systems that are in place, what we're doing to improve, as well as the budget. Um, and we, we appreciate those questions. It helps us think about the work that we're doing and hopefully continuously improve. But um, again, the amount of time and effort that went into both of those presentations, it is the work, but it also um, takes a lot for their teams to put all that together. So I just wanted to echo that thanks. 
Um, Dr. Hawk and I plan to share at our February board meeting our Prop S review with you. You'll remember back at the September meeting, we talked um, that we would be doing an internal review. We were also planning to get feedback and input from several of our professional organizations that work with us around um, what took place over the last couple of years. We didn't quite get the participation from some of those groups that we had hoped for, but we do believe that we have enough information um, that we've been able to review that we'll be able to talk with the board about changes to our process for future work that will provide additional oversight and transparency both for you and for the community as we engage in future um, construction projects throughout the district. Um, this would be specific changes to the process for how we work through projects, as well as working with our committee and the involvement we get. Um, what stop measures are there where that's being shared with the Board of Education for input? And after we share some of those recommendations, the board will then have an opportunity to discuss, are those just process changes we put in place? Or are there some things that we would want to ultimately put into policy for the district moving forward? Our plan is to share those recommendations as well as a timeline for prioritizing and moving forward with the remaining work at next, next month's meeting. I know everybody's anxious to um, continue moving forward with the remaining funds that we have and looking forward to those projects as well as the deferred maintenance that needs to take place. Um, one thing that I will say our review does not include is a formal external audit, which I know has been discussed by both several board members, patrons over the last couple of years at different points in time. Um, while I don't believe that is absolutely necessary or that it's going to identify any gross negligence or wrongdoing, I want to be clear that we are not against that idea at all. We welcome an audit, whether that's something the district would ultimately choose to pay for from an external auditor that we hire, or if the state would choose to come in and do an audit of the district. We've heard lately that's going to be a focus under the new state auditor. Um, there can be a significant cost to either one of those, um, depending on how it comes about, but we don't have anything to hide. We are working to be more transparent with you, with our community, and we realize that any findings from an audit, whether that is a firm that we would hire or it's from the state, it's going to provide us feedback on the work that we're doing. There are always things that we can do better. And so we'd be happy to discuss that further with you after next month's meeting and get the guidance around how the board would like to proceed um, with an audit of that. We still feel like that's a part of the um, formal process that you would like to take place. Um, a couple other thanks and celebrations. It was mentioned tonight that over winter break, we had multiple pipes burst, um, impacting seven different buildings throughout the district. Um, some of that happened both on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Um, we had over 40 different employees. We had staff members, support staff, teachers, administrators. We even had parents and um, students that showed up at our buildings when these crises were happening to help, um, you know, get things out of the way, move things around, try to stop some of the water flow, get water out of these areas. Um, you know, that's a lot to ask anybody to do on any given day, especially over holidays when we hope that people get an opportunity to rest and relax and enjoy time with those families. Um, that The quick action of people jumping in and doing that really mitigated a lot of the damage that could have happened if we weren't being as responsive as we were. So I wanna thank every one of those staff members and um, some of our parents and students that jumped in. Um, it allowed us to return to school right after break and open up that following Tuesday with very minimal disruption to what was going on in our buildings. We will be hosting our third Citizens Roundtable coming up on February 1st. This one will be held at Westwood Trail Academy where we held our board meetings often during COVID. Uh, a reminder that this is a forum for interested patrons to come together to really engage and problem solve around a relevant and timely topic. We've gotten positive feedback from um, patrons and staff who have attended the first two. There's still time to sign up um, and join me and our transportation team at this round table. We'll, we'll be talking about potential changes that we could have in our busing operation that would allow us to be more efficient, um, work through the staffing, significant staffing shortage we have in that department, um, as well as ultimately have a budget impact for the district. The link to sign up has been put out multiple times in emails, it's also available on the website, so we please ask that you join us. Howell of Fame nominations are open. Our Howell of Fame is one of our most prestigious awards, and it's really an opportunity to recognize individuals who go above and beyond in their efforts to support our schools um, and the district in meaningful ways. So if you can think of different parents, volunteers, community organizations, or staff members who really represent the best of the Francis Howell community, um, and who've had a lasting impact on the district, we ask that you nominate them. Um, nominations will be accepted through March 1st, and that form is also available on the website, or you can reach out to our communications department. 
Um, our Francis Howell Central Theater Program was actually chosen, this happened um, last month, but to perform, they did a Renaissance Fair one-act play that we had talked about over the summer at the Renaissance Fair. That one act was selected to perform at the state conference this year. That actually took place last week. They were chosen to perform twice in Kansas City. There were 10 student actors and a student director. Um, it's a tremendous honor for them, and I um, want to congratulate them and Kim Harrison and the entire program, the drama program over there at Howell Central. Last, I'm excited to share that we really hope to hold our board meetings at 801 um, Corporate Center Drive beginning in February, um, the home of Union High School and where our administration offices are now located. On February 2nd, we have scheduled a board workshop that will focus on the literacy program within the district, just sharing some of those details with the board and talking about um, some things we're looking at doing with interventions and things moving forward. To remind everyone, a workshop is an opportunity to come together. It's a little bit less formal of a setting, but it's an opportunity for um, administrators and staff to share with the board the work that we're doing and engage in conversation with the board that we don't always get to see in a formal meeting um, with just questions and feedback about the work that we're doing. So there are no patron comments. There's no other business at the meeting. It's just the workshop, but that will take place on February 2nd. And then assuming everything goes well, on February 9th, we hope to hold our first business meeting at that building and um, we'll plan to um, do a bit of an open house beginning at 5.30 before the meeting that evening to allow people to tour the building and then have the business meeting beginning at 6.30. So plan to be there unless we communicate otherwise things have changed. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Rumpus. Uh, on to board comments, requests. Any comments or requests, board? Do we have anything, Leo? No? Any thoughts or impressions? Just happy to be done, probably. <laughs> All right, uh, folks, I just want to draw your attention. We have some uh, information at the bottom of the agenda and upcoming meetings that Dr. Rump has talked about. Uh, and if you didn't hear how to sign up, that information is also located at the bottom of the agenda as well. So, uh, And we have unfinished closed business, so we'll be uh, completing this uh, open meeting in what do we say, about 10 minutes, take a recess and convene into the close uh, session. Thanks everybody. <laughs>